and welcome to this episode of the Selling Through Partnering Skills podcast, where I'm joined by Scott McTaggart. Hi, Scott. Sir, how are you? Very well, thank you. And I'm so pleased that you could you could join us because I've been dying to get you on since you scared my cat. That is um, that is the first and potentially the last time I'll ever hear that. Hey, I probably ought to explain a little bit more, really, because you do look a bit puzzled to me. Um, you'd, be, you'd be a great guest because of the fear you put into animals is definitely the first and, again, likely the last. It, it, it was along those lines. I thought... You must have been niche. fun in single life making approaches at the singles bar. Right? Like, ah. No, it's niching. We know niching is what it's all about. And I'm going after this very special niche of podcast. Um, no, I'll tell you what happened was I was, um, so I was listening to a podcast you were speaking on. It's probably your own, actually, the pitch works. Um, and uh, I was outside because we were in lockdown. I was doing some, doing some exercise and you shouted something out. And my cat was stood looking at me, pulling my rubber bands or doing what I was doing. And it just jumped and ran away. <laughs> so you scared my cat. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Like, I mean, like, I hope this doesn't lead to like legal action or something. Nah, I mean, you gotta remember, a, right? You know, it, I mean, cats are resilient. They they started off in the wild. I think the cat's fine, and I think we could probably leave this as gentlemen. It's recovered. I'll I'll send you the bill for some dreamies, but it's it's okay. There we go. Um, so, yeah, no, what, so what it was, it was what what you were saying was really really interesting because you shouted out something like don't sell or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a shout out. I and think what I shouted out. was you buy. I think I shouted the words you buy. I, this was on Steve Benson's tremendous outside sales talk podcast. And um, he uh, he said something like, uh, we were having a, one of those classic counterintuitive, what I call American standard podcast conversations where, um, you know, people say like, um, things that are counterintuitive and then sort of take a victory lap for having done so, right? You know, uh, but in this case, I think it's accurate. You know, when uh, when you when you shout, well, when I shout, you buy in that sort of like weird, like semi belligerent way. It's actually sort of an in joke to my little circle of friends because we used to laugh that there were people who never worked on their skills. They were able to get deals through just like sheer force of will, right? They could just like impose <laughs> and people follow instructions. People do like, and there are, there's a whole conversation about, you know, sort of like, what is your manager doing? How were you trained? What are the ethics? Like there, there's a lot of things, going into it, but largely we used to, and it's still an ongoing joke within my circle of friends to this day, that there are some people who can just make people buy by just insisting on it. And they never give a proper presentation. They don't do any qualification. They don't properly even introduce themselves. They just sort of look at you the right way or whatever. And the customer feels the pressure and somehow or another goes home with something that maybe they didn't expect to go home with. And um, like I dedicated my career to B2B. But when I was but a young buck back 25 years ago, I was doing B2C stuff and I got to watch it in vivid HD detail as someone who was like a, an absolute blunt instrument would present in front of a customer and just close a deal through nothing other than basically insistence that this was going to happen, convincing the customer of the inevitability of their purchase. And it used to frustrate me to no end because I grew up with enterprise sales reps as parents. Uh -huh. And the, the, the talents and the skills development was very important to me. And watching some dude just sort of strong arm somebody into a purchase bothered me at a level I was not prepared to deal with. No, no I think you're right. So hi hypnotic selling or insistent selling or whatever you want to call it. Mind you, that'd be a good book. Um, no, look, Pete, that's where we get a bit of that bad name around professional sales, isn't it? Because people think that is what really works. And, and we're, we're only really talking about what you've said there because it is so, it's so different. Yeah. It, it's so rare. It's, it's not a normal way of operating, is it? And certainly not in B2B. I, I would say I have a long list of pet peeves about what people think we do for a living. Right? <laughs> um, no, and, and like this is not like this is ge not like general misanthropy. This is um, people say to me, oh, well, my friend likes people. He should be a sales rep. 
or my friend really knows how to talk, they should be a sales rep, or I love getting to know people. Like all of that seems as though it's relevant and germane, but what we do from my point of view, which does not count for all that much, but it is how I manage my own career is I help explain things to people in a faster way than they could understand it self-taught. There, there are a ton of different ways that a, again, let's stick with my business to business sort of preference. There are a ton of ways that a business can improve itself. The problem is that time is such a rare and valuable commodity and they don't have the ability to investigate every possible improvement of their operation. So they have to prioritize. And if you don't make a certain priority level, then you're out. You just, it's not that your idea is wrong. It's just not producing as much of a return as some other idea. So for example, like, you know, the idea of consulting didn't come into our consciousness really for a typical business until say 34 years ago, really, you know, um, now there were people who had worked in businesses for hundreds of years before that, but the idea that you could, as a normal main street business, hire someone else who had done a thing that you want to do and they can explain it to you, well, it's relatively new. So selling is kind of like free consulting. It's this idea that you can tell people, hey, I understand this thing. It will produce some benefit. And I know that it would take you a long time to do that math and figure it out yourself. So I'm going to help you do it. You as the customer should be skeptical. So it's your job to be somewhat adversarial to my arguments to make sure that you're not buying something that doesn't fit you. But the idea is for you to determine the benefit that you would take because you are unique. And my job is to sort of explain to you the things you don't understand about that thing. Now, commodities are different, right? Like commodities now, it's more, you're not talking about the product, you're talking about the contracting vehicle, or you're talking about the convenience or the logistics or those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's basically like a customer could spend X hours learning about a potential improvement. And with the assistance of a sales rep, that becomes 0.25 times X. It's, you know, 75% savings on, on the learning curve. And that's what we do is we reduce the amount of time the customer has to spend fumbling around in the dark as they try to improve their operation, which is maybe the least exciting, least cinematic, definitely would not have made Wolf of Wall Street work <laughs> explanation of what we do, right? Because what they want to hear and what people secretly love to hear is this idea that you're just like, like the old cliche. And I think you and I are of similar age so that you've, you, you used to see people sell the sales training this way, where you would open up the phone book, put your finger on it. This is like the trainer would do this, right? And they would say, oh, well, Fred is going to get a call from me now. And then they pick up the phone hello, is Fred there? And then they would claim that they sold the deal right there in front of you, right? And this idea of like exerting your will, forcing a customer to do a thing with, without regard for whether or not it was a good fit. And that sort of bastardizes the whole meaning of the thing. It, it does. It's interesting. I mean, the way you described it there is so elegant. And where it might not excite some people, they're probably the people we don't want to excite. And there'll be others that have heard what you've just said went, Oh, is that what it's all about? Oh, well, that sounds pretty cool to me. I'd like some of that. And they're who we need, I think. They're, they're, they're yeah, they're, the definitely the a direct brand. line. Between, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. No, There's no. a direct line between consulting and sales, right? Like if, yeah. you, if you spend your life in B2B sales, you can absolutely then shift to, to consulting at some later point if you truly master what you've been doing. Because it is the same process. It is what you're doing is reducing the learning curve that somebody has in making a decision. Yeah. No, agreed 100%. And while you were talking, I, 
I thought of something that I often hear myself say to so sales is not something you do to somebody. And again, there's that right. the conception, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to do some sales to them. It's That's helping right. buy. And it's understanding it's their buying lots. process. And oh, it's not easy. My process. They go through my process. I'm going to do these things because that's what it says in the CRM. Oh, it's, it's, ah, it's old fashioned. And uh, look, there are people who, wait, who wait, are. Wait, 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 wait. I, I have to push back on that. It comes from a place of. So I think of the whole world as power dynamics. Mm-hmm. Okay? I think of power dynamics in terms of like strong person, weak person, strong organization, weak organization, that sort of a thing. There are a lot of people who are thinking of this as I'm going to sell this to you and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, exactly. So like, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow there, but I think this is really important. Like so many people have asked me for what I call Hogwarts advice, right? Which is where what they want is to hear a magical incantation that the target is uh, powerless to, to stop. Right. So, you know, I get my wand and I wave it around and I go, what can I do to put you in this car today? And it is, <laughs> um, it is this supposed to be this thing. It's just like, we've all heard this disgusting sort of like machismo thing that people do. We're just like, oh, you know, we're going to close them down. We're going to shut them down. We're going to take them down. We're going to, it's always down, right? We're not going to lift them up hold them up, <laughs> build them up, right? Um, and that's an interesting thing. Like, I think I think there are people that are magnetized to that idea of sales as a thing that you do to a person. But I honestly, I think it's disingenuous to attribute that to the CRM or the process or the training that you received. I think they do it because they want to feel as though they are creating a situation where they are powerful and other people can observe that power. Okay, I'll, I'll accept the pushback. To be honest, I think we're violently agreeing on the whole <laughs> on the whole way that sales should be. So uh, that's the only way to agree, sir. Yes, the way that you said it, because you just made me un- <laughs> no, um, no. So we, we do, and this is why I wanted to chat because I thought we're on the same page. This power, this putting people down, whatever we've just said there, for me, it's all about collaboration. The more we can collaborate, that's what's going to help us get to where we want to be. Consultative, collaborative, these things are what's going to make somebody really good at their job you know, today. And so that's why I look at this PQ, these partnering skills, because I think if you use those to inform your approach, whether you're in channel, whether you're selling direct, I would even say if you're selling B2C, you can use these to guide your mindset and to, to sort of adjust your behaviors to do the right thing. And exactly. I thought, you know what, I want Scott's take on some of these. And, you know, what could we practically do? What, you know, what things have you done and advice you'd give to people with each of these? So if we, if we can break these down and we could just chuck a few sort of hints and tips, not Hogwarts hints and tips, real life, this no, is how no. you do it. Um, it would be, so, be great. I'd love it. So one of the things that the PQ concept really got me thinking about is something that, say, like the millennials and the Gen Zs are doing well. And we would be well advised as, you know, sort of like the elder statesmen of the corporate universe to, um, to learn from them. They have this concept that, you know, that vulnerability is the new strength, right? And that sounds like wishy-washy sort of like that circular logic. Again, American standard podcast kind of, uh, well, you know, say something controversial or counterintuitive and then you know, kind of do like a Gary Vaynerchuk voila at the end. Um, But in order to partner, you have to expose your vulnerability. You have to say that there is a thing that you cannot do as a self-contained unit. And the way that the millennials and the Zs are doing this so convincingly is that it builds on something that you know we X's sort of started, which which was this idea of authenticity above all else, right? You know, if your um, lie detector is well calibrated, you start to realize that there are patterns between lies, right? Like things that people say that 
indicate that they're not giving you the full story or they've intentionally ignored part of the evaluation. So let's, this is getting too abstract. So let's, let's put wheels on it. Um, if I'm a corporation of decent size, I probably have some sort of decision matrix about what kind of technology I'm going to buy. And there's probably a column or a row that says price, and there's one that says compatibility, and there's one that says training, you know, debt, and there's all these other different things that I have to think about for this decision. And a liar or a person who is maybe looking at it as optimistically for their own purposes as possible will uh, accentuate what they're good at for that matrix, and they will maybe ignore or not call attention or not even think all the way through, which is in my view, the most typical version of it, um, the things that they do not excel at, the things that you know might hurt their case. So for example, if my product is the, uh, the least expensive, but it takes the most amount of training for someone to master, I'm going to accentuate my price competitive. Uh, my, the, the competition is more expensive than I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm going to de-emphasize how complex and convoluted our training is or our user experience is. You know, the buttons aren't where you think they're going to be. I may not even fully register that that's a problem because it is not in my interest to register that. And it is not, I'm not, it's not within my power to affect it. So a customer then says, okay, well, in my role, I'm supposed to be somewhat adversarial to all the reps and just keep them honest, make sure that they, their interpretation of their own value is you know, consistent with our interpretation, make sure that what they're saying is true and authentic and whatnot. Now here comes PQ. Maybe I partner with someone that actually is very good at delivering training and the, the world is filled with these now. Um, I do a lot of work in the cloud space, for example. Right. Well, there is a fantastic organization called A Cloud Guru, which I am in no way affiliated with, but for like $50 a month, a person can take a huge course load of cloud classes, which makes my job easier. Right. So if the customer's worried about learning these cloud platforms or, you know, how to put them to use or whatnot, I can with great confidence say, well, you know, this many millions of people have used the A Cloud Guru curriculum. Now, all of a sudden, I am being vulnerable. I am saying like, I, I am aware that some of this is complex. I am aware that you have trepidation about this and that you are looking at this as a program, not just a purchase. Because in order to buy this thing, you also have to be able to support it and maintain it and keep you know, keep people using it. And I'm not the person who sells you any of those things. So I have a vulnerability. And I think historically in the past 20 years ago, maybe there was this brawny sort of, it's all going to be fine, wishful thinking, magical thinking kind of a thing where we just sort of tried to pretend that it wasn't a shortcoming because the customer, oh, you'll learn it fine. If you can't learn it, you must be an idiot. No, I mean, you, you you, you're right. No, I'm thinking of training, you know, and it would have been, I can see the matrix. I can picture it. I've drawn it here and it's circle the ones that you're strong in lots and lots of conversation about that. And it is, it's always like, just, just hope they don't go there. They've got the same matrix in front of you. It's there. They've circled that one. So you, you know, and to kind of paraphrase a little bit, you might as well say, look, I know you're looking at that. That's probably where we're weakest, but this is what I'm going to do about it. Yeah. That's what you're looking at. So I'm great on the others and I patched that. So, Let's go on, you know, and that, 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 you know, that, that self-disclosure, the authenticity, yeah, that, that would work yeah. really well. Yeah, the authenticity now all of a sudden, which isn't on the matrix, but let's be honest, it's on every matrix. Yeah. They are trying to determine, can I trust you with at least some level of the judgment here? Because... Inevitably, no matter how complex their matrix is, they won't be able to get everything that's important to them into those Excel cells. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something. I have always done well myself with customers feeling as though I will be accountable. And that is not a thing that I do. It is a 
create that I communicate. And I think I do it by, to use your verb, by patching the things that maybe I'm not winning at. So I say, okay, yes, you're right. My product is daunting in its complexity. However, even if you add this training module from this partner of mine, my price still comes in at this level, which I feel makes me or keeps me competitive. Right. So now again, like that vulnerability, that acknowledgement that I am not going to get a perfect score in every category, which is a non like that, that there's nothing controversial about saying I don't get a hundred percent in every part of the matrix. <laughs> but somehow we fear that it is. It's controversial. Oh, my boss can't hear me say that. I think to even be able to say that is showing an advanced level of selling because you know what the matrix is. You've done something to elicit that information. You've either got such a level of trust that they said, look, here it is. <laughs> That's what making the decision on. Or you've worked it out um, whichever way. And when you say it's the person, they're like, that guy's good. He knows how I'm thinking. And, and you might even have had a conversation, which is, do you know this matrix you're going to build? Because I know you are. You might want to put this on it. And I'm saying that mm. even though I'm not the strongest in it. I mean, you can take this to the next degree. They go, are, you, are you mad? You're actually saying I should judge on something that you're not good at. Yes, because that's what you need in your solution. Whoa, now we're talking. Now we've moved on a level, haven't we? We have, and we've moved on to probably my favorite topic, which is that every purchase that you make is a statement on your identity. Mm -hmm. And what does this purchase say about me is a very difficult question to answer because most people haven't paused to ponder on like, what does my choice of copier say about me as a person, right? Like they're, they're doing this in real time. Yeah. Well, I'm a Xerox man. Xerox is the only brand there is. Get out of here. Um, but it manifests as different things, such as I'm not the person who gets lied to. Whoa. If I catch a rep lying to me, a person like me does not put up with dishonest sales reps. A person like me does not fall for the old tricks. See, the identity conversation is deep. These are like reflections and staring into the abyss kind of conversations because all of a sudden you realize like mastering this is never coming. You will never master this because the customer is a unique person with a unique history. But there are things that are pretty easy to say, well, I can't see anyone wanting to be that. I can't see anyone wanting to be the person who falls for an obvious lie. I can't see anyone being happy about putting up with behavior, right? So I've seen reps that go in and they tell what I would call political jokes, right? These, these can cover a lot of ground, but most political jokes are grenades because you don't know who's on the other side of the table. And it's mm -hmm. a calculated risk. And you love taking it because that gives them that adrenaline rush of like, oh, what happens if, <laughs> right? Um, but the thing is, like, there are some customers who go, a person like me doesn't buy from someone who is so haphazard and reckless in the process. So before you whine about the PC police coming to put you into handcuffs, think about it on a more meta level, which is this person that you're selling to likely wouldn't allow that behavior from their own sales reps. And you demonstrating that behavior shows that you are not like them and you being not like them puts your whole deal in jeopardy. And the identity yeah. question is, it permeates everything. And it, and it gets into these things again. So now we're back to PQ, right? So if you're talking PQ, what you're saying now is that it's an even harder thing. Now it's a dance with a partner. Yeah. 
Yep. Right? But now you both have to move as a unit. Yep. And you say like, okay, well, when this happens, we have to keep the customer's identity questions in mind. A person like me, I think you heard this. Um, it, you, you've heard some of the some of the shows I've done. You've heard some of the conversations I've done. Um, one that I always kind of fall back on is, um, you know, do you do you like women? And they say, you know, most men, you know, a lot of times, yes, I, I, I'm interested in women. And I say, well, then, do do you subscribe to Maxim Magazine, which is, you know, if, I don't know. I assume that that you know that thing's still being published. I don't know. Maybe it's not. But um, <laughs> you get these sort of quizzical looks from people because they're like, how did you get there from there? And the, you know, the point of the exercise is just to say like, nobody wants to be the adult male who receives Maxim magazine because from an identity's perspective, it's repellent. It's, it's this idea of like, oh God, even if I do get it, I don't want you to know about it. <laughs> um, and this is, this is that. Now you're gonna go in and you're gonna say, this is who I am and why you should buy from me. And this is how I see the world. And this is why you should trust my judgment. Watch how my view of the world is actually proven out because your matrix matches my decision. Yeah. But you bring in that partner who buttresses some of your points and makes you look more, you know, more useful to the customer. But that means you need to do even more work in, in matching with a good partner because it is vulnerable. So you have to have your own matrix and your partner needs to be trustworthy. It is a very powerful solution. Working with others and having them sort of compliment you, you're strong where they're weak and vice versa is good. But you also need to be very mindful about what road you're going down and why you're going down it. Sure. Yeah. And, and then the, the conversations, the open and honest discussions around that, exploring well this is what i expect for it this is what i need this is what you guys need I mean, it's relationship we, we could be sort of in some kind of not a sales discussion a relationship type podcast discussion because the same things are there you know um right. and uh, well, of course that's what that's where the, the pq elements would would map over it's um but a person like me that is such a powerful phrase um yeah, I've 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 underlined it about seven times <laughs> um, as as I've been making notes while you're talking. It's because insane. there's a lot in that. There's a lot in that. Well, it gets even better when you realize that it doesn't have to mean the person that I am today. It can be the person I want to be tomorrow. Yeah. Now we're getting into you know sort of like the natural trend for people to over you know, to give themselves maybe like more benefit of the doubt, you know, when, when people do self appraisals, they give themselves higher scores, right? Um, so it doesn't matter how accurate that person's self appraisal is. Just when you hear a person like me, you should be thinking a person like I'm headed toward being a person like I want to be a person like I want to be perceived as these are all reasonable substitutes, wow. but it is yeah. an, it, it naturally unlocks the aspirational part of your pitch. Funny enough, that was a word I just wrote, <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I've also drawn a triangle. I've drawn a pyramid because I'm thinking back to some of that work that Bain did recently with the um, the elements of value that they did mm -hmm. first with B to C. They went, guess what? People buy emotionally. Yeah, well, okay, you didn't need to study that. It's the same in B to B. No, come on, we're all logical animals in that. It's corporates we have these matrices like we just said they kind of okay we'll do the, we'll do the research then <laughs> did the research came back exactly the same you know they talk about yeah. the table stakes don't they as in yeah you gotta be the right price you gotta be the right spec it's gotta work and you gotta be ethical yeah of course it does right because you're that we'll now talk to you when you start looking at those elements closely linked to maslow aren't they where you're going up and those that's where i am now you've got to help me stay where i am you've got to help me be that person to aspirational to um you know the, the higher levels that's clever well, selling real. That's clever clever selling this idea the, the, this idea that you know like um like decision decision matrix or how decisions are made like that is a lie corporations tell themselves <laughs> they do not make decisions through the matrix they justify decisions through the matrix 
That is an entirely different animal. Yeah. You can make a decision as long as you can justify it through the matrix. Yep. You do yep. not make the decision through the matrix. And anybody who tells you different is selling something. A matrix. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, I read a book probably 20 years ago now. I believe it was called Sources of Power, and I cite it all the time, so I should probably go and make sure I know the title. But um, it, were, it was a bunch of people that studied how decisions get made on short and long timelines. And one of the interesting things was that they didn't talk to business people. They talked to people that have normal jobs, right? Like, like just functional jobs that don't seem as though they require too much analysis, but when you actually look at any job, it requires analysis. So firefighters was one of the groups that they studied. Nurses was one of the groups that they studied. And it doesn't matter if you're making decisions for what to watch on television or, or you know what ERP system to install at your sleepy company. You make a decision first. You get invested in, in your in the outcome that you want and your reputation as a prognosticator. You then go through the process justifying the decision you've already made. Yep. That is how humans actually make decisions in nine out of 10 situations. Absolutely. We were talking one out of 10 being it's a crazy thing that just can't be predicted, right? Yeah, the, yeah. the outlier is, you know, you're a fireman and you show up on scene and it's not flames coming out of the windows, it's balloons, right? Then you don't have a snap decision in your gut because you're now on the, the you're in the upside down, you have no idea what's going on and you really do need a matrix because this is all new influence and your output is not predictable. But matrices help you justify a decision and if a, again if, if a decision is if a purchasing decision is emotional in nature again we come back to it's the statement on identity and authenticity i truly believe that yeah no it's uh, again we're, we are on the on the same page with that and it's uh, it's, been, it's such an interesting interesting discussion I think there might be another one about decision making we ought to have about when firefighters arrive on the scene and the levels of training that they've had and how they can automatically do stuff because they practice every day and they know what to do because it's drilled into them. And maybe we learn from that, but let's not open that kind of worms just now. Let's, let's save that one for, uh, for another time. You do that, day. man. <laughs> I knew you couldn't resist. Go on, then. Five minutes on drills it. and practice and training and that kind of stuff gone because I want, I want your opinion you on that so lovely it'll be meal laid out for me and told me i couldn't eat it <laughs> go on then go on <laughs> all right so very quickly i will say that you know one of the there's, most there's an, sorry to interrupt you but there's an influence thing there is it say so you can't have something <laughs> well i want it 100 <laughs> but no it's a, it's an interesting question for a different reason though because um you know my own you know, influence of not being allowed to have something notwithstanding the, uh, uh, the idea has been in vogue for some time that you grab a bunch of green peas out of college and you stick them into, you know, Skype headsets and you make them just hector people for money, right? Like, I would love to see a study that shows that that is actually a better way of doing sales because I do not believe it. I think that your first say 18 months are so incredibly important and formative and being surrounded by a bunch of other people who don't know what they're doing is the noodles on the wall approach, right? Like, well, let's just find out who has it in their genetic code and fire everybody else. Um, and I've seen it a lot. I don't know how much you see it, you know, in, in you know the industries that you play in, in the geographies you play in, but I've seen a lot of companies where they hire a bunch of like 22, 23 year old, say, I don't know, business grads, you know, like somebody that doesn't necessarily have like a specific track that they're on, like, a, you know, they didn't go for accounting or 
the law. And then they, they just say, oh, I don't know, you know, here's a list, pound it out, call all these people or email all these people or LinkedIn message all of these people and hit them up until they buy or die. And I think the training thing is so important because like, okay, grab somebody off the street and ask them what the steps of the sale are. Just ask them. And I don't even care what their answer is. Most people can't answer the question. Most people that do our job can't answer the question. Like when I take, when I train, I teach what I jokingly refer to as like a tongue in cheek little like dad joke where I say it's the five and a half steps of the sale, right? <laughs> where you, you introduce, you qualify. There's a half step of confirming your qualification. Here's what I heard you say. Propose, negotiate, close, right? And my wife probably hears me say that while I sleep. It's one of those things I say so often that she's probably heard me say it in a dream uh -huh. because it's, it, it's ready to flow off my lips at any time. And, you know, the firefighters, yeah, they have lots of training. They have extensive like burn houses and textbooks and probably YouTube videos. I was going to say film strips just to prove how old I am, but um, I'll cut that out. The, Don't worry. The idea, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, you can't cut out the gray on my chin at this point. Um, no, but like the practice piece determines your success. But if we take a bunch of rookies and we throw them into the deep end of the pool and don't give them success, they're going to fail. They're going to, in some quantity, succeed for the wrong reasons. Like, yeah. like behaviors that will be very hard to deprogram out of them later. Yeah, again, for me, we're so, it just makes sense. You know, you're not going to go, oh, I've got a shiny new fire engine. Let's get a whole load of new people and say, hey, look, there's a load of kit. Go and use it. it. It just wouldn't work. You know, building a sports team, you wouldn't go, let's get rid of everybody from last season, get a whole load of new, fitter, younger people because they'll be able to run faster and expect to win we'll a load of games. We'll win games just because of the uniform we're wearing. It, it That's the analogy. We'll yeah. win games because we're filling the blank with whatever the team is. Yeah. They think that, like, oh, we're, we're a BC company. We have 400,000 employees worldwide. You know, no one ever got fired for buying our product. So we're just going to fill all these chairs with rookies that don't have a, a, you know, like a proper process and don't have someone reinforcing their good behaviors. And then we'll determine who has the genetic code to do this naturally or who grew up in a house where this was already sort of part of the ethos. And then... Once they've proven their value to the corporation, then we'll invest in training. Hmm. That's ridiculous. Oh, again, we <laughs> we could talk long in long into the night on this one and and, and ways ways around that. Um, but but look, yeah, fascinating insights. Look, you've been so so generous in in sharing in sharing your thinking. Um, this this idea about to about the identity and then a person like me i know what the title of the podcast is that's easy <laughs> it's selected itself um and yeah i also know some exercises i'm going to build into some of the training i'm doing in the next uh, the next couple of weeks um because yeah i i'm even thinking i'm not sure i help people around that identity piece enough it, it's still i do talk about the emotion but it's probably still a little bit too logical we need to be getting more into it. Use your PQ to really dig down into that area and understand it. Well, I've certainly learned from that. When you're talking about partnership, right? And I've, I've spent most of this conversation talking about us going in with like, I, I, I focused almost all of my energy in this conversation about like supporting cast on the deal side. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but there is a really important thing about you can't, help the customer on the identity side until you've reached that mutual point of vulnerability between the two of you. Uh -huh, right? uh -huh. The customer has to, has to tell you something true about what they want. Um, so like in an RFP process, requests for proposals are famously scrubbed of any of the things that people really want, right? Like, you know, they say, oh, I want to know how many volts and megabytes and whatever is in there, but it doesn't say anything about like, I want to make sure that I don't get treated like an idiot. I don't want to be jargonized 
Um, you know, I want to know that they have a sense of ownership, right? These are things that don't make their way into the RFP process. Um, you know, which is funny because, you know, you get some of these textbook sized RFPs and you think, well, everything that's ever happened in the world is in that book. And, but you need that customer. Again, if partnership is, is mutual vulnerability, then they've got to say, hey, Fred, what I really want more than anything is someone who will tell me when I'm making a bad decision. And I've had a bunch of clients, long-term clients, who have said those exact words in that exact order to me. Huh? What I really want to say is going to tell me when I'm making a bad decision, not just tell me the thing I said I wanted, but instead look out for my best interest to get up on your back legs and fight me when I'm wrong. No, no, absolutely right. Tell me when I'm making a bad decision. You hear that, and you know we are already well on the route to to building those building those trust bridges, aren't we? For someone to actually say that, someone to say that, we're we're getting there, which is which is cool. But then you have to respect it. Like like this is a, again where I start to feel dirty when I hear people say like, oh, we'll take them down, right? Close them down, right? Because you've been trusted with something with this vulnerability that is so. It's sacred, right? Like someone yep. has decided to put you into a position where you can hurt them. And they've done it because they believe in you and and they need your help. And then, you know, again, this sort of like shallow transactional, well, I'm just here to pick your pocket. You're just a mark to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it, it's dirty, it makes me angry. No, me too. And it makes me angry that we kind of get tired of that same brush and that, and that people are still thinking this, you know, it's sales has come a long, long way. That's, that's 1900s snake oil selling, maybe a bit 1980s because we sort of had a little blip of a regression, I think, broadly, but 90s, noughties, 10s, it's, we're getting more professional. But hey, look, I'm, I'm preaching to the convert here, you know, and, and hopefully people are listening are, are probably already on the, the journey with us. So There's a reason that to preach to the convert, right? And it's because one of the things is there are people who haven't thought of these things yet. And we try to give them a framework of like, I, I would swear to you, I muted that phone. You've been sabotaged by the Apple Corporation. I apologize. All these dings in the background. Are, I promise I muted that phone, but apparently I'm not very good at it. Um, but we talk about these things in public because a lot of people are trapped in an organization that does not model good behavior. Mm. And sometimes it's because they don't know good behavior. And sometimes it's because they're on a skeleton crew and you know the, the budget does not afford someone that can talk to somebody about the fact that there are, an, there are true self-evident ethical and moral forces at work here, right? I, I do not feel bad about anything I've ever sold, ever. I've never pushed anybody into anything that they should not have had. Now, there are a couple times when I had a customer bluster and shout and be completely obstinate. And I, I decided to let them have what they insisted on. And I took great glee in them learning <laughs> after the fact. I am human. I do not want to pretend to be the Pope here, right? Did you, you know, justify that emotional decision by I was being cruel to be kind? <laughs> they no. got a good lesson for doing it. No, you were just No, I, I just I <laughs> see what I do as a specific thing. And when people come along and they're like, well, you know, I think cyanide makes a lovely salad dressing. There's only so much I can do. Yeah, you're right on that. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. I'm very aware of your time and that you say you've been, I say I could go on and on chatting about this stuff and say, hopefully we'll, um, we'll get a chance to, uh, to, to kick some more, to kick some more ideas around. But, but certainly, as I say, you know, a person like me. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask you one more question then. A person like you, how would you like to see sales perceived this time 10 years 2030 beginning of 2030 that's a lovely question 
and I don't know that I have as much thought behind it as I should, but I'll tell you what my gut reaction is. Mm -hmm. I would like to see marketing and sales sort themselves out rather than have executives that maybe don't understand the nuance of those practices sort of keep breaking down the boundaries. Marketing is a pre-sales activity that creates demand by giving you a taste of that consulting that the sales rep delivers in detail. I would like to see marketing basically say, of all the consulting that our sales reps are doing, and it is, I, I still believe it as being like consulting in the sense that they tell you, a, they give you an insight to improve your understanding of a potential refinement. You can buy something that makes your business more profitable or more liked or whatever. And marketing's job is to basically say, wow, of a hundred meetings that we did last month, 80 of them felt that this was an important point. So now we're gonna put that on the side of buses. Right. Now we're going to put that in a white paper that we distribute through LinkedIn. Right. Marketing's job is to basically find the broader truths of all those little consultant engagements. And I don't think we ever really talk about this. I would like to see sales be seen as the data collection sensors that they really are, inform the marketing effort better, and have customers and senior executives realize that this is, again, a consulting function. It is an external facing consulting function. And the sales rep's job should include gathering data for the marketing function so that we understand what insights keep coming up and what messaging therefore needs to be put out on the, on the street. But instead we treat it like every customer is a unique and wonderful snowflake who has nothing in common with any other. Sales reps are to be ignored by marketing because marketing you know, does you know, a different type of research and sales experience is anecdotal, which is accurate. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to say that sales experience is not anecdotal, it of course is, but you know, every single data point from those marketing interviews is an anecdote. It's only a mass when it starts to become patterns and trends. So I, I don't know. I, I think it would, I'm not worried about legitimacy. Frankly, there's a whole lot of people I don't care if they think I'm legitimate. Um, you know, I'm entirely comfortable with where I am and exactly how you know, I'm perceived at cocktail parties when people think I might be trying to sell them things. Um, but I do think that the customer suffers from us not building that bridge. Because now we have, we're pretending like we don't know what insights the customer is going to take away in some cases. If all the sales reps were sharing like, oh, wow, I had this meeting with Fred. Fred was shocked to find out that he, he can save 80 hours of employee time on this report by doing this thing that we sell. And now the marketing folks have, have access to that data and they see it across the entire market and say, wow, apparently this is something that resonates with folks. We should make that part of our larger messaging. That's where I'd like to go. Right then, let's book in a session in 10 years time <laughs> and we'll see what's happened. We'll have, but look, we, I, I hope we're gonna, well, I know we're gonna chat before then, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll set that date, see where we're at. <laughs> I'm terrified to ever look back on predictions that I made. So I don't know that we're going to book that in, but. So, so, so am I expecting a no-show? You're telling me 10 years <laughs> in the future, what's going to happen? That's pretty cool. <laughs> Let me hear. What you said was, let's book it in advance. What I heard was, hey, let's look back at all the ways you were wrong. Um, <laughs> it's like when you have friends who, who see a photo of themselves from 10 years ago and they go, what was I thinking about with that shirt? Um, <laughs> I'm that guy. I will first look at the mistakes that I made and be just just mortified by them. Oh no, that's that's brilliant. No, no. Well, look, we're going to be chatting before then. I'm absolutely sure. And um, 
hopefully there'll be people who might well reach out to you because they might want to pick up on some of these things and sort of kick the ideas. Yeah, Absolutely. But Best I'm not plugging anything. I don't want anybody to think I'm plugging anything. Here, wait, I'll plug something. Donate to the Red Cross. That's Donate. cool. I love the Red Cross. They're an amazing organization. Donate to the Red Cross. Reach out to Scott McTaggart on LinkedIn if you want to ask any questions and tell him how much you sent to the Red Cross. Oh, Easy my as goodness. That. Fred, you're a pro and a half. That was amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So, uh, no, cool. Scott, thanks so much for your time. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll chat soon. We'll see how our predictions are going soon. Thanks for the invite, sir. Uh, take care. Thank you.